Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's another week of Flames hockey and another week of Flames wins, which is not something that we're used to saying as Flames fans. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, isn't it weird to see the Flames doing as well as they are? Like, as Flames fans, this is the time of year they tend to break our heart. Yeah, well, like, even uh, a couple of years ago when they finished as the second best team in the NHL, like, the last month and a half of the season was a little bit awful as they kind of stumbled into the playoffs and then got hammered by Colorado. Uh, so this is a little bit of a departure, but, you know, a Daryl Sutter-led team is not going to be taking any game lightly. This past week, the Calgary Flames were on the road for two games. The first time they've played two games on the road in one week since February 1st and 2nd. And uh, they started the week off by playing the second of their home-and-home -home series against the Minnesota Wild in St. Paul, Minnesota. And in this one, um, Markstrom made 32 saves for the Flames, who won, this was 12 of their last 13 at this point. Minnesota lost four straight in a 5-1 win for the Flames. What were your thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, the Flames decided to play a very different game, I thought, than the previous matchup. I think the Wild I, did, too. I thought the Wild yeah. were much more physical. Yeah, exactly. Like, the Flames basically beat them up and took their lunch money in the first game, and in the second one, uh, they uh, decided to play the finesse game because Minnesota's like, oh, well, we can play physical, too. And it's like, uh, yeah, well, we just scored on you five times. I think Minnesota played a much better game overall in this one, but definitely more physical. Yeah, and to be frank, like, if you're giving the Flames the ability to have your you playing a game that you're not used to or suited to, then the Flames are going to kick your butt. And, well, 5-1 says it all. Yep, I, I think that's probably about all there is to say here. But uh, And we'll talk more about this after the week recap, but a good Flames win against a good NHL team. Oh, yeah, for sure. And any time that you're going up against one of the better teams, and, like, frankly, if you're a playoff team at this point in either conference, you're a good team. Uh, if you can go in and play them and dominate them in a back-to-back -back like they did... Uh, like I think they outscored them uh, twelve to four in the two games. Like that's impressive. So yeah, Minnesota it, very good logged for them. Forty eight hits in this game. I can't remember last time I've seen forty eight hits in a game. Uh, didn't the Flames do something similar the game before? <laughs> I'd have to check. I don't think it was that high. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah. Well, no, and it makes sense that Minnesota is like, well, hey, we're not going to get pushed around, but it's like. Uh, thanks for getting yourself out of position so we can make nice, fancy passing plays instead. And, and and every rink counts hits a little bit differently, too. True. Calgary got 29 hits the night before. Oh, okay. So, I it don't know, maybe... It didn't really seem that Minnesota was being more physical than the Flames were the previous time. Y you know what the problem is? We count hits in the metric system. Ah, that makes sense. You gotta convert to Imperial. When okay, we go to the so, States. so really the 29 was like about 64 then. Something like that, yeah. yeah. we got to convert to Imperial when we go okay. across the border. That makes sense, then. Um, but, you know, I, I think something good in this one, too. Calgary won more than half the face-offs, um, which I know has been, you know, a large part of the um, the Flames' success is when they can win those face-offs. But, again, in this game, still too many guys in the penalty box. 17 penalty minutes for the Flames, according, and 15 for the Wild. Not that I didn't expect that, but you've got to stay out of the penalty box. Yeah, and to be a little fair, you know, like five of those are obviously a fighting major, so it's not quite as bad. But yeah, any time either team is uh, get delving too many penalties, it's not 12 a twelve good... minutes is still a lot of penalties though. If we strip out the oh, five minute sure. major. Um, and the Flames got 12 minutes in the box the night at, or the game after as well. They were back in the Saddle Dome for their only home game this week against the Montreal Canadiens, the first home game since, I guess, of 2022, really, where they've been able to have a full crowd in the Saddle Dome. And Tyler DeFoley got taken on his old team as the Canadiens bested the Flames 5-4 in this one. Yeah, this was just um, taking a team too lightly. Um, like if you look at two of the goals that Montreal scored, 
it was uh, like on their fourth or fifth shot in quick succession and it's like you know markstrom's a great goalie but you know there is really only so much you can ask from a guy and, you know and when you're doing it multiple times like it, it's just not fair to the goalie and uh then the the very careless five on threes in this game like it you know it's one thing to take a penalty but you know the lack of discipline like there's a door off penalty for high sticking like yeah he hit did hit the linesman which caused him to hit the player but you have to be more conscientious and you know those all those little mistakes all ended up costing the flames in this one this is one of the few games this season where we can say the flames have been outworked yeah, oh, for sure. Montreal, they gave it their all. And they don't have anything really to play for other than spots for next year. So you're seeing on an individual basis that everybody is giving it their all. And, you know, to be fair, they, they do have quite a number of good players uh, like Rem Pitlick, uh, who is noteworthy in this game. And really, I mean, when you score four goals in a game, you should win that game. So the fact that Montreal scored five, I mean, I, I thought that Calgary's – Defense didn't look great here, and I think really in this one, the Flames got what they deserved based on the way they played. Yeah. Uh, if um, Hammond was not playing as well as he was, uh, the Flames probably could have outscored their way to a win. But, you know, yeah, they, they were also giving a lot more up in front of our own net than we should have. True. 17 it, giveaways by the Flames in this game. Yeah, like the, this was just a very... And, Put it this way, like, if uh, this had been a better team than Montreal, you're looking at, like, the same game as the Vancouver game last week where it's 7-1 to one and, you know, a laugh. Or, but, um, yeah, the only reason why the Flames got a point even was just due to the fact that Montreal is terrible. Yeah, it's, that's fair. And when you mentioned uh, they got a point, this game did go to overtime. But, yeah, I mean, you're not – when you're a top team in the league – and I think this is a great example of anybody can lose to anybody on any night, whether you're a top team or bottom team. You know, everyone has good nights, everyone has bad nights. Well, even on that same night, uh, the Colorado Avalanche lost to the Arizona Coyotes 2-1 to one in regulation. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that, like, yes – that you know we lost in spectacular fashion but it's not like we were the only one yeah no that's true um this game took place march 3rd and the last home loss for calgary before this was january 13th so this ends the miracle streak of the flames winning everything in the dome yeah 11 games in a row i i was almost expecting they might go on a multi-year uh home winning streak and you won't be able to knock down the dome because we keep winning there yeah well, yeah, crisis averted there. There you go. <laughs> we'll just rent out the dome because we can't knock the thing down. Yep. And I think after that loss to Montreal, the big question was how the Flames were going to do against arguably the best team in the NHL. I mean, definitely in the West, arguably maybe in the whole NHL. On Saturday, the Calgary Flames traveled to Denver to take on the Colorado Avalanche. And I have to say, Matt, I think this was the game of the year for the Flames so far. What an awesome game to watch. Well, the thing is, is that since that uh, Colorado series uh, a couple of years ago, basically every time the Flames have played the Avalanche since then, which hasn't been many, uh, it's basically been the same storyline of the Flames getting absolutely hammered in each of the games that they've faced off against them. And thankfully it's only been a couple because of uh, COVID having to play against the only Canadian teams last year, but... Um, this was very much a met meter stick uh, for this team. And seeing, okay, this is one of the teams that, if the Flames do actually make it to the conference finals, there is a very good chance that the team that they're going to be facing is this Colorado Avalanche team. And, you know, it, it, when you've been skunked by them repeatedly for years, it, it, you know, like it, it's very important to regain some of that confidence sort of like when the flames finally won in the honda center and i think we've won most of them since that it, I, I think this game was very important to get that monkey off their back i think this game really showed off the evolution of calgary's blue line since that playoff series as well i mean back then it just seemed like 
you know, McKinnon and even Ladiskog and some of the really fast guys on that Colorado team blew by us every time they got into our zone. And this time it seems like Calgary was able to largely neutralize that speed. Yeah. And uh, a note in this game, Erica Branson scored, which since January 26th, the leading scorer amongst NHL defensemen is Erica Branson. This is proving his fifth that this, of the season. Yeah, proving that this is the bizarro timeline. Where Eric Branson is the most amazing offensive scoring defenseman in the NHL. Matt, let me guess. You want to convert him to forward? Not quite yet. You know, okay. He, he needs to I'll show ask you again he, next week. He needs to show that he can do this for more than a week. A couple All weeks. right. Well, let, let me make a note to ask you again next week. Okay. Um, Pencil that in for the next show. There you go. I'll add it to our show notes. Interesting, uh, I guess, development here. None of us expected. Dan Vladar got the start, and I think we're all expecting Markstrom to get the start here. I think if you look back to the Montreal game, I don't think Sutter was all that happy with the defensive play, and I wonder if he started Vladar to make the team play a little bit better and not rely on their goaltender, which I felt like for the last couple, they've been relying more on the goalie to bail them out. Well, and plus, uh, you know, the how would you say there is less margin for error Whenever your backup goaltender, no matter how good he is, you know, in order if you're wanting to actually win, and this team, you know, because of how important and how much history they have with the Avalanche, you know, like they could have just played mediocre and got blown out. But, the Avs are twenty three three and three at home, so even if they play well, they're likely not going to win there this year. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, like if you're playing in a defeatist mindset or, you know, lackadaisical, uh, you're going to see a result where like the Avalanche beat you 6-7-8-1 like we've seen since that playoff series. And uh, to the Flames' credit, like the Avalanche scored early and then the Flames counterpunched, scored back, and then the Avalanche scored again. Flames counterpunch scored very quickly thereafter again. And it was very much a chance for chance. It, it was literally a heavyweight fight, you know, that you would pay on a pay-per-view type mm-hmm. thing. It was, frankly, the two best teams in the West going at it. And Outside of face-offs, pretty much all the stats for both teams are the same in this game. Yeah, and punch for punch, both sides, and... Both goalies were feeling it, and, well, Frank Hoos, not so much Kemper. But <laughs> well, Let's talk about that. That's got to be the earliest I can remember a goalie being chased from his net um, by the Flames. The Flames had Darcy Cooper, Cooper starting the game, and after three goals, which was, what, midway through the second? Uh, it was only a couple minutes in. It was, yeah, uh, he played 39-10. So, that, well, yeah, that would have been a few minutes into the second he got pulled. And Frank, who's their backup? I didn't even know who their backup was, went in after that. And he looked a lot better. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's one of those situations where, like, the second That's and right. third C- goals. C- Cooper for, got pulled right after the good Branson goal. Uh, with the second and third goal for Colorado, like neither one of those were goals that realistically um, Kemper should have had. Like he was screened on the good Branson goal, and it was perfectly placed off the post and in. And the other one was just a weird like knuckle puck that went past him, and it, it was more that like I think trying to wake the team up, and you know. Uh, you're having some success with our starters, so here, deal with our backup instead. And yeah, it, it was an interesting uh, switch. It ended up working well for the Colorado Avalanche. And but... what a boost for Dan Vladar to go in against the top team in the league and get that win. I mean, this is a month where you and I have both said we're going to have to rely on Vladar more than we have. And I think that's going to be an amazing thing, both in, for you know the way the coaches view him and probably in his own head as well. Well, yeah, and the fact is that he was able to not only just make the routine saves, but there was a number of highlight reel saves. Like, even on the uh, Landeskog a minute in, uh, the goal that he scored, he, he dove across and got the his stick on the puck in the midair on the first one, and the rebound got tucked in. It You know, like, he did an amazing job, I think, in this game. And, uh, like, a... 
a, easily a 9 out of 10 performance by him, and that, you know, it, I don't think the Flames get two points if it wasn't for Vladar. Do you think you could say that Dan Vladar earned his 750000 right there? Pretty much, yep. Yeah. And he probably earned a very substantial raise on that one, too. <laughs> We'll see. I mean, you know, memories are short in the NHL, so hopefully his agent has footage of the game for when it comes time in not yeah. next at the end of next year, not this year. So, yeah. Um, to me, I think the most impressive part of this game was not even that the Flames won, but that the Flames went toe to toe. Like you said, it was a heavyweight bout, and the Flames were able to hang in there. I really didn't care if they won in this one as long as they showed they could play with the big boys, and I think they did. Yeah, and, uh, you know, like, if you're looking at, like, a playoff series, like, this is easily one that could go six or seven. I it, mean, even if we would have lost in the OT, I still think the Flames, you could have said, had a great showing in this one. Yeah, oh, for sure. And it would have been like, oh, that's disappointing, but they usually suck in overtime, so, yeah, okay, sure, fine. But, you know, they did manage to get the two points, and... Uh, just sets up the 13th as being the next really important game for this team, which will be even more interesting because they play f like five games in seven days. And that's well, the fifth one. <laughs> and here's the interesting thing is that next game on the 13th is a back to back. Do you throw Vladar back in there? Yeah, definitely. You know, cause or, or do you swap him up and put Vladar against Detroit and give Colorado a different look? Uh, no, I think you go back with Vladar just because hey, you know, he might have their number, and why not? And then we play him again on the 23rd. Like, he could be your avalanche killer. You could see a playoff series where it's Markstrom all the way. Oh, we're playing Colorado. All right, Dan's going in for the whole series. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, it's one of those things that, um, especially with the Flames, I'm expecting the next uh, avalanche game to be a loss just because, you know, it is the fifth game in seven days and the second of a back-to-back. -back, like, they're going to be gassed. Colorado's not. So... Well, and again, you know, I think it's going to be how do they manage that. Yeah, and that's where it's going to be interesting. And that's why I'd be more uh, wanting Vladar to start that one and have Markstrom have the better shot at getting the two points against Detroit. But Yeah, I can see that. You know, it's just one of those things that... A little bit of A, a little bit of B, you know. See if Ladar can do his magic again, and then, you know. Well, with that game, the Flames are pretty much caught up now in games played to everyone else in our division. Um, we have 54 games played, 33 wins, 14 losses, 7 overtime losses for a total of 73 points, and we're starting to slowly run away with this division. L.A. is second at 69, Vegas third at 66, Edmonton fourth at 64, and Vancouver fifth at 62. So, um, Calgary's got some cushion here, but yeah, they're they're starting to run away with this. Yeah, well, I I, I basically have it where like the Flames have pretty much clinched a playoff spot. Um, yeah. You know, because they're so far up on Edmonton that it's just not realistic for the other two and Edmonton. And then, you, especially when you look at the schedule, the Flames' hard part of the schedule is ends at the end of this week, and then only six of the last twenty one games are against teams in the playoffs. So, like, it, it, the Flames are going to be playing a lot of really bad teams moving forward after this week. So, you know, uh, I yeah, it's going to be a lot easier for this team. Sometimes I wish we were a vid video podcast so we could show off visuals. But today the NHL tweeted on their Twitter account um, how congested the Pacific Division was. And somebody responded with a video of Forrest Gump running with the Flames logo replacing Forrest's head. Yep. They're just taking off. They're already gone. It, it, it literally is now a battle for second place. Run, Daryl! <laughs> Run, Johnny! <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I think you're right. Like, at this point, the Flames are in. Even if they fall a little bit, it's, uh, it's like you said, a battle for second. And even if the Flames... I mean, looking at this, I don't think L.A. is going to overtake the Flames. No. I think Vegas could take L.A. Yeah. Uh, like, they've been really good, but I don't see their streak being sustainable especially because they have a tougher well calgary has the easiest schedule in the league so like they have a tougher schedule than us just by default because literally every other team in the league has a tougher schedule than calgary uh but you know like it, it's hard to overcome that point percentage and then on top of it the flames have a lot more games against really bad teams that they should win 
And when we look at the Western Conference, Colorado's at 85 points, obviously number one. Calgary at 73, number two. And St. Louis, 71, uh, third place. Do you think Calgary's going to maintain that second spot? Do you think St. Louis is going to overtake us? What are your thoughts there, Matt? Um, I could actually see the Flames pushing up towards Colorado. I'm not saying catch Colorado, but... Like, I don't I, think they'll catch Colorado at this point. No, but I, I think that they'll draw within about six or seven of the Avalanche, just due to the nature of the schedule the rest of the way. Like, I'm Frankly, I'm expecting the Flames to be running a rough shot over everybody throughout until the playoffs, just because of the nature of we're good, they're not. Yeah, and I, I don't know, I'm... I'm not. So, I'm surprised, honestly, that St. Louis has done as well as they could. I could see L.A. overtake St. Louis, but I think St. Louis might stumble here in the next month or so. Yeah. Well, even then, uh, you're likely looking at uh, L.A. playing Vegas in the first round, uh, no matter really what permutation. Like, I don't see Edmonton recovering enough to pass either of those teams. <laughs> I, I Even don't. if Edmonton were to get the best goal in the league at the deadline, I think that, they, yeah, they're not going to do it this year. No, and, like, frankly, I don't even see them making the playoffs because you, you look at the Central Division, like St. Louis, Nashville, uh, Dallas, and Minnesota, they're all really good teams. And, you know, like, it, it's going to be tough for Edmonton to jump over any of those teams. So, you know. It'll be interesting to see, but I, I I am beginning to strongly doubt that the Oilers will actually figure a way to get into the playoffs. Which would be kind of amazing because the top two point getters in the league both play for the Oilers. Tied at 79 is Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. And not too far down at number four is our own Johnny Goudreau at 71 points. And Matt, it's weird to think that right now Goudreau's one assist away from uh Connor mcdavid oh i know and that's why it's looking more and more like gaudreau might be a actual contender if not favorite for the Hart trophy um because like you look at the oilers yeah they have two really amazing players but like that's it and <laughs> you know like even though they got a vander kane like that's not enough and I wonder how much of this is Daryl, how much of this is him maturing, and how much of this is Johnny on a contract year. I'm wondering if we might be better just try and sign him to a series of one-year deals so it's always a contract year. Uh, well, I honestly, I think that the Flames are going to sign him to a long-term deal after this one. And um, it, Gaudreau, uh, like, uh, Daryl gets a bit of a mischaracterization as being, you know, like, detrimental to skilled guys like he's always been one to facilitate anybody who has high-end talent and make them even better and uh, you, you know you just look at some of the flames players when he was last year the kings how many of their guys elevated their game you yeah know. no that, that's true so like Gaudreau being amazing like he's learned how to play effectively at both ends of the ice as has Elias Lindholm and you know it it's really the whole team has taken off and I, I'm just thrilled that Daryl's doing as good of a job as he is for the first time and I would say over a month the Flames played two really good teams in one week and I mean you could even say you know playing Minnesota twice in you know a 10-day span They've looked good against both those teams. You know, they they won both of them. They looked good against them. Um, Matt, like, when you look at this, do you still think that the Flames are looking as good as we think they were? Or do you think that they're, you know, being propped up by some of their, uh, their wins against lesser teams? We did see, I'd say, in the Minnesota games, some stumbles in the way this team played. Yeah, but every team, regardless of how good they are, uh, have periods in games where they're not as effective. Nobody's and, won all 82. No. And, you know, like, even if you look at Colorado, Tampa, and Carolina, the three best teams in the NHL, uh, like, they still have lost, like, 18 games each. You know, like, that's a lot of games that they've lost. And, you know, like, and they're clearly better than everybody. Um, 
on paper anyway. So, um, you know, it's uh, one of those things that, um, yeah, Calgary has struggled, but um, now that, like, the games are getting more intense and uh, more on the line with each game in terms of seeding and everything, like, you look at Minnesota, like, they're only three points up on the Oilers for ninth, so, like, these games are important to them, too. And yet the Flames are just able to dominate, control the play, and dictate it, and and are able to have that flexibility, like that two-game set against Minnesota, to play the game two completely different ways and kick the ever-loving out of them in two completely different ways. I think being able to play different ways was the story of February, too. I think we saw the Flames really play every team differently. Yeah, and, you know, like, if the Flames need to go and play that physical banger style like they did in the first game against Minnesota to send a message, they were able to just run them over. And, you know, the other team responded by playing a different way than they're used to which opened up a lot of lanes that the flames were able to pass a lot of nice pucks through and get a lot of goals that way i would say that after that week i'm more convinced that the flames um could you know be going deep in the playoffs and i think this coming week is going to tell us that too playing tampa bay um you know playing colorado again i think by middle of march we're really going to see do, can, can the Flames sustain that? And as you said earlier, it's a busy week for the Flames, but playoffs are busy too. And I think this this next week and a half is really going to be a, a big sign for what this team's got. Yeah, and this is one where, to me, there is enough there with what you're seeing both in terms of how they're playing the character with which they're showing and the overall talent level that I think that this might be a year that they have to go all in uh, just because, you know, like they, and they already have to some extent with getting to fully, but like go all, all in. But The we'll, Flames fan of me though, Matt says, when are they going to crap out? Like we've seen seasons like this and at some point the team always goes in a losing streak and craps out. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, when do these guys crap out? Well, there was one year uh, a while ago uh, when there was a certain guy behind the bench and they didn't really crap out at any point. And, you know, they got For that sure. guy and, back. And, and I mean, as we said earlier, too, they have too many points now to really crap out. But it's just, I guess, that, you know, hesitant Flames fan in me. That's what I keep thinking. Oh, I know. And I agree to an extent. But I think, like, this is one of those times where... Like, objectively, it's looking more like the stars are aligning in the Flames' favor, uh, especially with the makeup of the team and uh, how everybody seems to be pulling in that right direction. Uh, like, you, if you look at the other good teams, like, they're good because they're very talented, um, like, say, Florida or Carolina. But I, uh, I think that, like, those teams are kind of top-heavy-ish, and not built throughout the lineup necessarily as effectively as they could, it, where, like, they're beatable. Um, Calgary, though, like, especially if they do add more, um, like, another guy of, like, Toffoli's caliber, you know, then it, it's like there are no weaknesses. Have fun with that. And, you know, Colorado's basically the only other team that's fairly strong th- one through and you know uh it it might be one of those situations where it comes down frankly between us calgary uh colorado and tampa bay uh for who is going to be the cup winner and And we're gonna see tampa bay on thursday so we'll see what the flames have against them yeah and like that's where like some measuring sticks are coming up like you know like the games against edmonton and detroit while important in terms of collecting points are not as necessarily important in terms of you know in the room like what do we have to do to be better you know and etc etc and you know like that game against tampa bay is going to be 
as important in my mind as the Colorado game. And, you know, the Colorado game, again, is going to be an interesting to see exactly how the Avalanche respond. Right now, when I look at the Western Conference, and I'm just kind of looking at teams the Flames have coming up, I guess the only team is a Flames fan. I, there's two of them. One I, I think is warranted and one isn't that I'm worried about. Colorado and Edmonton, just because we always seem to not play well against Edmonton lately. Well, Edmonton basically views beating Calgary as their Stanley Cup because, hey, we beat the Flames, so we're clearly better. And, yeah, not really. Um, so it, it's one of those where... You know, like the Flames have to... I remember you and I one year went to a preseason game against the Oilers, and as we were leaving there, there was guys waving their flags like they were, you know, had won the Stanley Cup. I was like, dude, this means nothing. Yeah, literally. I, and frankly, like with the Edmonton Oilers, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that the Flames have been guilty of is respecting Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl too much. Uh, you know, and granted, they are great players, but you know, they're they are also hockey players. Uh, go hit them into the boards repeatedly, um, like they did with the Avalanche forwards. Like, yeah, so you're Nathan McKinnon. Um, enjoy being on your butt. <laughs> you know, like that's gonna be how they're. You know, in order to beat Edmonton, like they're gonna have to target those guys and you know, play that physical, in-your-face, playoff-style game if they actually want to beat the Oilers. Yeah, I think I think you're right, and I, I'll be curious to see. I think since the last time we've seen the Oilers, this team has grown quite a bit, so I'm excited to see what we get this week against the Oilers. Same here. Well, Matt, with that, I think um, big question I wanted to talk to you about this week is Tyler Toffoli, and you mentioned him, a big part of this team since we brought him in. Do you think we're using him as effectively as we could? And let me give you my thought here. I think putting him on the third line with Sean Monaghan is a good idea, but I think that Toffoli is a guy who I think has always had a few skating issues, and I think putting him with Lucic and Monaghan, Lucic has never been a great skater, and Monaghan, who's lost a step there, might not be letting him really get out of him what we need to. True. Um, I also think that this is a placeholder line. And, um, looking at, you know, um, what I had mentioned about going all in, uh, Lucic is clearly the guy that sticks out as a bit of a sore thumb on that line. Um, the, in the very much a similar manner that, uh, like Nick Ritchie did when it was Dubé and Monaghan with them. Like, you know, uh, and... It's one of those things that I think that the Flames, like, if they are going to buy all in and, you know, make that run, getting a guy to play opposite uh, to Foley as another skill winger, I think, will be imperative. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, but I think even within our our own roster right now, because I don't know what they're going to be bringing in there, I, I think I would make some changes here. I'll, I'll pose two scenarios to you. Tell me what you think of these. I think it might be time to swap Coleman and Toffoli. So your second line becomes Mangiapane on the left, Backlund at center, and Toffoli on the right. And I think there you've got enough of a little bit of everything on that line. Um, and, and I think that that might better show off Toffoli with guys that sort of complement his weaknesses. Yeah, and it's one of those things that um, if the Flames are going to stand pat ish or go and get like a defensive forward for the third line like a Cali yarn crock um then that situation of moving to fully up onto that line makes a ton of sense because now you're having Manjapane playing that off wing skill guy for to fully which will generate a lot more offense for both of them yeah, and, and I just I feel like Blake Coleman is a little bit more of a versatile player than Toffoli, and then I think he can play on both sides of the ice better. And I think putting him with Monahan and Lucic, it's you're going to get a little bit more, um, a little bit better synergy on all ends of the ice there. Yeah, and like that, that's where, um, like again, like if the Flames go and get the Yarn Croc type guy for the third line, 
to play off of Coleman, like that makes a lot of sense. Because then you're basically recreating like the backland line on the third line, at, while having the skill line above. So you know, either way, like it, it's a viable alternate. It's just uh, it basically boils down to uh, what the Flames can do to add one more piece. And, and we'll talk. We'll talk more about some of that next week as we oh, were sure. then two weeks away from the deadline. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of deadline talk starting now, and I think we all know right now that the Flames probably need a forward. Yeah, and what the one good thing is is that there are plenty of options available for either role, and you know, like the Flames can go UFA hunting on the cheap if they want a skilled guy. Or they can go a little bit more, and if they want to get another guy like Toffoli, or defensively on that front, getting a guy like Yarn Kroc, like those kinds of players are always available for relatively cheap. So, you know, it just everything depends on what the asking prices are and can they fit it in cap wise. The other potential change I'd make here is I'm not sure that the fourth line of Lewis, Dubé, and Richie is really using Dylan Dubé the way he should be. And you and I have had some discussions about Dylan Dubé in the past. I think the other option I could see there is, and we've seen this already, but swapping Lucic and Dubé around and making it Dubé, Monaghan, to Foley. Yeah, and um, I, I think that the main reason why uh, that might not have been done yet is um, is just not wanting to mess with things too too much uh, before moves are made necessarily but you know like if the flames are standing more you know wait, waiting more towards the deadline i could see definitely see dubé getting reinserted onto the third line yeah it just again that seems like a more complete line to me and then your fourth line of lewis lucic and richie really becomes your heavyweight line yeah and I, I also liked when Richardson was playing on that line, too. And, you know, like, it, it uh, having Dubé slot in, uh, to me, uh, actually, like, in the last game, even though he played well, I think took a little bit away from that fourth line. I agree. I think if you want that fourth line to kind of be your checking line, I think putting Dubé there mitigates some of its effect. Yeah, like in the past couple games with uh, Richardson, Lewis, and Richie, like I thought that the fourth line was at times our best line, and um, like it, especially in that Montreal game, they were very effective, and uh, at times they were basically the one line that was actually doing things, and you know, um, so taking away from that uh, doesn't necessarily help, but. It, you know, it's one of those we have to see what Dubé's up to as well. And, and yeah, and, and, I, and I think that even Dubé with Monahan to Foley, you're you're giving Dubé a line where I think it's going to be tough to look bad. Yeah. Well, and also, um, just as an aside, like I think that uh, it might not be the worst idea to sit Lucic a, a little bit here and there, um, just because of the number of games, because he's looking a little less so the last couple of weeks uh, ever since things have been really ramping up to playing every other day yeah I don't know I mean Lucic I think is still bringing energy and we're still seeing him fighting and doing some things paid for so I don't know if I'd sit him but I think I'd move him to that fourth line even if you gotta take Lewis or Richie out to do that I think he brings an energy to both the room and to the team where you want him on the ice but on a fourth line minute on, on a fourth line role I should say He's. I'm just looking here. The average for that four lines is about six minutes a night, seven minutes a night. So I, I think you know, even at that, he can find a way to to produce the way he needs to. Yeah. I just. I mean, if you take him out, I don't know. Then you've almost got to put Rujicka in. And again, I look at that as. Well, I guess you don't have to. You could sit Rujicka and Lucic, uh, and and put uh, Richardson back in. But I guess I just. I don't know. I don't see the benefit of taking Lucic out entirely. Yeah, it wouldn't be like a permanent thing. I just think like the odd game here and there, it might not be a bad idea to swap him out. Yeah, we'll see. I, I'm, I don't know. I I think Daryl likes him too, and I think he'll he'll stay in for that reason. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, the Calgary Flames made a trade this week. 
Um, unfortunately, my favorite Calgary Flame in history is left. Goodbye, Mr. Considerations. Um, the Calgary Flames moved future considerations, everyone's favorite flame, to the Montreal Canadiens, which is the second deal we've made with the Canadiens in a month for Michael McNiven, a goaltender. So McNiven coming to Calgary Future Considerations, which you and I both know Future Considerations means we get him for free. I mean, when does Future Considerations ever turn into anything? Hey, next time I see you, you buy the coffee. Yay, Considerations met. I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of those things. You know what? And uh, because, you know, Toffoli stick didn't get here in time, you owe us another goalie or something like that. But, yeah. It's, it's a weird move. I've seen a lot of discussion about this move, though, on Flames forums, Twitter, Reddit, about why are the Flames bringing in a goalie? Is Wolf moving? I would be shocked if, if Wolf were to move this year. Like, honestly, the only way I could realistically see Wolf getting traded is if you're getting a star caliber forward and that's the, the cost. And, like, I mean, like, an in-his-prime star caliber player and i i just don't see that kind of a trade happening anytime soon and like it just it doesn't really and that's not the kind of trade that i think is going to happen between now and the deadline if that happens exactly that's like a draft day deal i think because those kind of players you'd be trading for would be i think a guy in a playoff team so it's not going to happen between now and the deadline my thought on this, Matt, and tell me if you think differently, I think, you know, for the first time, Stockton is looking good. I mean, the Flames are having a great year. The Stockton Heat are having a great year. Down in Stockton, we have Dustin Wolf, obviously, and Adam Werner, who they brought in in the offseason from Colorado as the backup. Werner's not really, I don't think, pushing the way that they want him to on Wolf to, you know, push him to be that starter. But I think this deal is really more of a insurance market. You'd hate to lose Werner, and what have you got? You've got to go to, you know, especially if there's a deep playoff run for Stockton, you got to go, what, to Kansas City and bring up some random guy? I don't even know who's down uh, there. Daniel Chechelev. Chechelev's there. I think Andrew Shortridge is there. I was going to say outside of Chechelev because I think Chechelev will get recalled for the playoffs anyways because Kansas isn't going to make it. Yeah. But I think I think this is just a a depth goaltender to be in the system to give you some options. Yeah, and for note, um, the Stockton Heat are actually the single best team in the entire AHL in terms of point percentage, and like not every division plays the same number of games in that league, so it is actually sorted by point percentage. And the uh, Heat are at a 7.44 percentage. Uh, the next closest is actually their division rival, the Ontario Reign, which is the LA Kings farm team. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the best team in the league right now, the Stockton Heat. So I think this is, you know, just like we're talking about the Calgary Flames bringing guys in to shore up a playoff spot, I think this is just the Flames bringing guys in, you know, as a as – a, insurance piece for their farm team which when your farm team is doing well you've got to do as well this is a 24 year old goaltender McNiven who I think is probably a career AHL I mean he's had a couple of cups of coffee in the NHL um, he's played in the NHL what in um, yeah he's he played one game this year I think he's played one game three games in 2019 2020 but um, uh, you know as a league minimum guy who's an RFA at the end of the year I think this is really just the Flames making sure they have options in Stockton. Yeah, and it, it never hurts. Um, like, especially when you are you have uh, such a good guy as your starter, uh, because usually the AHL teams play, like, on three consecutive days. You need to have a good backup to play one of those games. And um, McNiven's not bad. He's not great. Uh, and like he could fill in in the NHL in an emergency, but that's about it. If you were the Heat going forward, would you be putting uh, Adam Werner or McNiven on the bench behind Wolf? Uh, probably I'd alternate uh, McNiven and Wolf or um, Werner, uh, just to keep both guys fresh, but like say like 70 30 for McNiven and I think the other thing too is McNiven's an RFA next year I believe Wolf is technically an RFA but will convert to a group six or something so he becomes a UFA yeah Werner Um, is a UFA yeah so 
So I think, you know, this just gives the Flames one more guy they can decide if they want to qualify or not, if they want to keep him in the AHL. So, I mean, anytime you can get an asset for free, you take it. And they've really got a, you know, a free goaltender out of this. Even if he never sees the NHL, you need goaltending depth. And I'm not I'm not convinced that Chechilev, his best development is coming into the AHL next year as a backup. So I think this just gives the Flames some more options there. Yeah, and like frankly, it's better for Chechilev to start in Kansas City and just keep starting in Kansas City. Um, it's just uh, one of those things that the Flames just need to have some quality backups in both the A and the ECHL. And you know, McNiven, I don't think any any team has ever you know not been happy with having goalie depth. Exactly. It's like, oh no, we have too many good goalies. Oh no. <laughs> the horror. <Yeah. laughs> and, you know, I, I guess I wanted to bring this up too because I wouldn't be surprised if you see the Flames before the deadline put in a waiver claim or something like that on another guy they think might be able to help the AHL. Like, I think this year we're serving two masters in a way. We've got to look at the NHL team and the AHL team. And usually our AHL team is no, not very good, so you're not worried about stocking them. But I even thought, you know, this week was Zarnik and, uh, you know, on on waivers. I thought that could have been a pickup there, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, Ole Levy was on waivers. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if you see the Flames pick up one or two guys with the same intent as McNiven as being farm depth. Yeah, and uh, I think at the trade deadline, you'll probably see the Flames make three or four trades that have absolutely nothing to do with the Calgary Flames. Yeah, or it could be bringing in two guys, one for the Flames and one for the farm or something like that. Yeah. Any sort of, uh, you know, assets for Stockton. And, like, it, it would be possibly, like, uh, two mediocre depth guys on Stockton for an actual good player for Stockton. You know, or something yeah, the other that line. the other big depth piece I think they could do, and I'm not saying they would, but I could see if they were to bring in another defenseman of trying to sneak stone through waivers and send him down. Yeah, that's possible. So, yeah, I just, I think we'll see some more interesting deals here as the Flames try to make sure that Stockton and Calgary are both stocked. And I think, you know, learning how to win at any level is important. And I think that having Stockton number one, um, you know, is going to be good for those guys. And I think it might also be a reason that we'll see maybe less call-ups down the stretch because they want to make sure those guys are there to help Stockton win as well. Mm-hmm. It, what is it after the deadline? They can do, what, three or five call-ups? Four. Four, okay. I was right between the, yeah. the right uh, option. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I think, I think you'll see some of those call-ups managed in an interesting way because of that. Yeah. Well, and frankly, for Stockton, the main guys that would get recalled are Peltier, Phillips, and Val Valimaki and Mackey. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't really see anybody else making the jump at any point. No, I don't either. And, you know, it's interesting looking at this goaltending squad for the Flames now. I mean, let's take Tyler Parsons out of it. But the Flames, I think, for years had... They, they almost had no goaltenders. Like, remember the Ramo Hiller years where there's nobody on the farm? We had no prospects. We were trying to find whoever we could. And now I'd say that that's one of the stronger areas of the Flames, both, you know, NHL and, you know, Dustin Wolf. Well, and, like, that's where, like, uh, for a number of years, like, on our show, uh, like, I would be preaching uh, during, like, our draft preview show of just keep adding Take guys. Take a goalie. Yeah, every year, just keep adding until you find, you know, your Kiprasov level replacement. Just because, you know, and the Flames, to their credit, have been drafting goalies with, with Wolf, with Chechilev, with Sergeyev, uh, bringing guys in uh, like uh, Zagadulin, uh, McNiven, you know, and keep cycling guys in and getting Vladar from Boston. You know, who's another really good young goalie. Keep cycling until you find that really good top tier guy. And and if you know. nothing else, even mediocre goalies can get you a decent return. If we bring in two or three of them and we got to part with one, exactly. Like you everybody get something needs for a goalie. Yeah, like everybody needs a solid goaltender. And you know, Edmonton needs two. 
Yeah, they need like five, but <laughs> anyhow, um, you look at like Anaheim back when they had uh, Freddie Anderson and uh, John Gibson, like they had the ability to play both evenly and evaluate, well, which of these two guys legitimately is better, and they're both really good goalies, and they got, got to keep the better of the two and trade the other, and they ended up getting a pretty good return for Freddie, um, and, uh, you know, so it's one of those where, like, it worked out for them, and, you know, Calgary seems to be going down that same yeah, road of, on me. I'm just we have, come back. like, at least three really good goalies, and maybe five. And, you know, Matt, I think on the goaltending front, too, I don't think that any of us expected Vladar to be as good as he is. I mean... You know, for the guy he was and what we paid and what we're paying him, I don't. I think we all expect a serviceable goaltender, but I don't think anyone expected Dan Vladar to look like what he has. No, and that's why, um, you know, it was important for the Flames to go shopping for, you know, because there are some teams that just naturally luck out with several good guys at the same time. And, like, when you have, like, uh, Linus Allmark, uh, Jeremy Swayman, and... Uh, Daniel Vladar, like Boston did, you know, Vladar is clearly number three on that chart, and they were going to lose him for nothing, and the Flames were able to capitalize, and, you know, the Flames were able to capitalize, and that's the important thing. I mean, I remember that before the season started, saying to you that I thought Vladar and Werner might be competing for the backup job, mm -hmm. and now Vladar's number two and Werner's number four. Yeah, and not only is Vladar... Uh, number two, but he's looking like an actual quality NHL goaltender at the, who could be a starter on some teams. Well, and, yeah, and I mean, we can talk more about goaltending in the future, but it'll be interesting to see because really I think, you know, we've got only a few years left on the uh, on the Markstrom deal. I think we've got about four, four years left. Yeah. So by the time you – Vladar's got two, so I guess, you know, you kind of re-sign Vladar – and then it's really, is Vladar your guy? Is Wolf your guy? Or do you transition away from Markstrom to a Vladar-Wolf pairing? Like, it, it's going to be interesting to see over the next, let's say, five years what happens in the Flames' net. Well, exactly. And, you know, like, if, say, Vladar starts looking like he's Markstrom, then, you know, you might just say, well, hey, we can use that $6 million elsewhere yeah. uh, and trade Markstrom. And similarly, if Wolf is looking like he's a star caliber guy, sure. But um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm excited about Wolf, but you know, do it twice. I don't want to get too excited after his, his rookie year. Yeah, exactly. And you know, be the best guy in the AHL, and okay, <laughs> then you're pushing your way into the NHL, and then we'll have to have a conversation. But you know, yeah, and, and plus, uh, you know, like. Frankly, like if you assume that like next year is another AHL year, um, you know, like now you're halfway through the Markstrom contract, and you know uh, the contract situations for everybody is a little bit more fluid, and like a guy like Toffoli is a free agent at the end of next year, so uh, you know you're starting to look at, well, hey, you know what makes most sense then, but yeah. I guess, you know, just smart move for the Flames to lock Vladara for two years. Oh, yeah, I think definitely. he'd be he'd need another it'd be another guy needing a big raise at the end of this year. And I think we're gonna look at that and go, Wow, we've got Vladar for seven fifty next year. Yeah, which that certainly helps. And like uh, and like um what I mentioned before with the good Branson, like I wouldn't mind him being back if it's basically at the same ish dollar amount just because that's another cheap option. Yeah. And, you know, so that way, like, more dollars can be filtered upward um, while maintaining a lot of continuity. I agree. Well, Matt, that kind of wraps things up for this week for the Flames. I think it's time, as always, that we look ahead to what's coming up for the Flames this week. Murderer's Row, <laughs> brought to you. La <laughs> la last week, neither of us got our predictions right. You thought we'd win all three. I thought we'd win Minnesota and Montreal and lose Colorado, so... Um, we split the difference on the points anyway. Yeah, that's true. So you're still beating me for for nothing this year. Yep. Um, this week is going to be a tough week for the Flames. You said at the top of the show, they have four games in, I, I guess, five games if you count you know, Sunday to Sunday. They play Edmonton Monday, Washington Tuesday, Tampa Bay Thursday, 
Detroit Saturday, and then they go on a quick road trip to Colorado Sunday. So four game, five games in in seven days. Yeah, it's actually gonna, five games in eight days. But yeah, yeah, it's gonna be not very fun for the Calgary Flames over this next period of time. And you after know, that, they things really slow down, though. Yeah, like the it, these are the five toughest games of the year, and then like basically six of the following twenty one are against good teams. So, like, this is the tough part of the schedule. It's tough because there's good teams and also there's a lot of hockey. Yeah. Like, even if we were playing variations of Montreal all week, it would be a very tough week to go, like, four and one. <laughs> so, uh, we have – we're going to record next Sunday before the Colorado game, so we won't predict that one. But we have the four-game homestand here, Edmonton, Washington, Tampa Bay, Detroit – Back at full full strength in the cell dome. We're no longer shorthanded, so we can have all our fans in there again, which I think will help the Flames. Um, and if you haven't seen the Flames yet, now's the time to go see them. Go to the Dome. We've got a ton of games this month, so go uh, hang out at the Dome and be part of the energy. And I'll say, someone who's been there, even from up in the press box, the energy this year is like anything I can remember in the last handful of years. Like, the, the Dome is rocking this year, even when there was only 7,000 people there. Yeah. Um, as for the predictions, I'm going to go loss, win, loss, win. So you're going to say we lose to Edmonton and, uh, Tampa Bay. Yeah. And beat and Washington gonna... and, and Detroit. Interesting. Where do you see Vladar playing? Uh, probably the Washington and the Colorado game next week. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and weird start times this week too. Like I don't understand why Calgary Edmonton started seven thirty. There's no time difference there. Because why not? You know, like, like you know, seven o'clock on Tuesday is what we expect. Thursday seven p.m. start time. Saturday five p.m. Fine, whatever. It's Detroit, but why are we starting seven thirty? Calgary Edmonton. Uh, because why not? You know, like, like it makes it's almost zero like a, sense, but it's almost like a union mandated lunch break. We got to start half hour after it. Yeah, it, it's one of those where, like, I could understand it if it was like a Tuesday game against Minnesota or something starting at seven thirty. Because sure, why not? Or or you know, like in Minnesota, where maybe there's a baseball game or something on before you need the time. Calgary Edmonton on like you know Western sports channels. Nobody else is playing. Exactly, like, like preempt uh, darts. We don't need to be preempted for, you know, Calgary Edmonton. Yeah. It it is confusing, but I guess uh, there's just, there must be some reason for it. It just, it it eludes me. That that I know. I'm going to go this week, and this is a tough one for me. I'm going to say that we win Edmonton and Detroit, and we lose Tampa Bay and Washington. Yeah. I think we're going to kind of sandwich this week. I think we'll win Edmonton. I think we'll lose Washington. I think they'll be out of gas for Tampa Bay. And I think they will find a way to win Detroit. Yeah. And now watch this be the week that they sweep the week. <laughs> Probably. Just because um, we're being down on them. I don't know, Matt. Like, I'm just looking at this. I don't know you can sweep this week. Yeah. Even well, as good as this the, team is, I don't think you can sweep this Yeah, week. like, honestly, if they get out of the five games that are coming up, like, if they get two wins, I'm fine with that. I think you've got to get two wins. you got to be 500 this week. Yeah, like, even if they only get four, four out of the ten points, that's... Because of how good they've been, that's an acceptable step well, back. And this is the thing, is we have the padding right now, right? We can yeah. afford a week of... I mean, even if the Flames were to lose all four, which I think is more realistic than the winning all four, yeah, they've got the padding to absorb that. Yeah. Not much more, but yeah. And it, it's just one of those things that uh, Calgary, like especially like once they get through next Sunday, like uh, the quality of their opponents is significantly less, so it gives them a lot more leeway um and where like this week you know it's just kind of like hang on and get through it and you know it, it you're facing three really awesome teams plus Edmonton and Detroit I guess the only bright side of this week is they're all at home true 
Like, can you imagine if we had to jump around for those four games seven days? Yeah. Like, could you imagine starting here against Edmonton, then having to go to Washington, then to Tampa, and then to Detroit? Like, the, yeah, that, that'd be awful. Yeah, I mean, we'll have a week like that in April where they play L.A., Anaheim, San Jose, Seattle in one week, which isn't a terrible trip, but at least you're all on the road. Like, I think this week would suck if you had, like, two at home, two on the road. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, uh, it, this is, like, the week that I'm, like, most interested in for the rest of the whole schedule, uh, just because, like, everything is against this team for this, like, between now and next Sunday, just because, like, you're playing five games in a week, and, you know, three really good opponents and two decent opponents, that are both ninth you know like it, it's this week feels the most like a playoff week to me yeah and i think that daryl is going to be at you know getting the guys to treat this like a playoff series and you know like if at the end of the five games would i be entirely shocked if the flames went four and one not really um but that would be mostly on daryl <laughs> You know, yeah, four getting and one them. I think would be the absolute best they could do. Yeah, and like that would be Daryl really motivating them and getting them through. And to go four and one, we're gonna need to start getting some depth scoring. Like yeah. you're gonna burn out your your top line here. So I think you know in order to get four and one, even in order to get three, you're gonna need to get some of you know you're gonna need the Toffoli line scoring. You're gonna need the back of the line scoring. Maybe even gotta get a couple from Lewis. Who knows? But. Um, I think you would really need your depth scoring going to to get more than two this week. Well, we already have NHL scoring leader from January 26th forward, Eric Branson. So what more do you need? There you go. <laughs> Good Branson could just clean them all up for us. Yep. 7-1, Eric Branson gets six. Yep. <laughs> um, that's I don't know how you throw hats a second time. Do you return them to the fans to be tossed again? I'm not sure that would work. Uh, no, the people that clean it up, uh, they actually take the hats out. And there they're you like, go. hey, we need more work to do. <laughs> there you go. The ice girls will do it. Yeah. Um, before we sign off this week, I do want to ask something of everybody listening. We would really like for you to go and review our show or give it a star rating or whatever your platform that you listen on allows. We want to reach more Flames fans. We're finding more and more demand this year for our show and more Flames fans looking for shows like ours with the flames doing well and by reviewing our show in wherever you listen to the podcast apple podcast uh spotify google podcast wherever you're listening to us it helps to get our name out there to a wider array of flames fans so if you could take some time this week to review our show to leave a review of it let people know what you think if you're allowed to leave a star rating on your platform we'd appreciate that too but that's going to help to get us out there to more and more people. So come playoff time, we can get our, our audience even bigger as the Sea of Red starts to rise and, and more eyes are on our team. So that's something we'll ask of everyone listening this week. Yeah. Well, um, we always appreciate each one of our listeners listening to our show, and that's why we do this show. So, yeah. Matty, are you going to be tired of Flames Hockey by the time you talk to me next? It's like a, I'll be logging into our uh, weekly Google chats, and it's just like, oh, it's you. We have to talk about this. Oh. <laughs> like, I'm just looking at this, and I'm thinking, I don't have much time to do anything else this week. I've got four Flames games to watch. Yeah, and then, like, immediately when we're done our show, because we're actually going to be recording, like, two hours prior to puck drop on Sunday. It starts all over again. Yeah, then we literally finish our show wrap up i say go flames go and then we go and watch the game <laughs> well by the time everybody hears this tomorrow it'll be about time to watch the game so why don't you give us uh, a simulation of what's going to happen next week well as always everybody go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino fireside chat is licensed under creative commons license for full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.